Tonight we are in Revelation chapter 1 as we start into our study. And tonight we're actually going to uh, start off by reading uh, a few of the verses from Revelation chapter 1. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 8. And so I would encourage you to look with me at Revelation chapter 1. And we're going to look at verses 1 through 8. We're going to read it and then we're going to go through and uh, talk about some of the stuff that is uh, in there. And so just follow along. I'm reading from the New King James Version tonight. Uh, I'll use the NIV going forward. But the book that we're studying through, he uses the NIV, I believe, as his basis of Scripture. And so I'll use the NIV going forward. But just follow along in your Bibles, and we'll, uh, we'll go from there. We're going to read verses 1 through 8 tonight. It says, the re- This is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. And so right here we have the, uh, the beginnings of this book of Revelation. And so tonight, as we uh, talk about for the first part of tonight, we're going to be talking about some of the introductory things that you need to know about the book of Revelation that are revealed in those first uh, eight verses and the rest of chapter one. And so we're going to be going through your notes uh, tonight, as, I, as you see there, the first thing we're going to talk about is the subject of Revelation, the subject of this uh, Revelation that was given to John. Uh, as you see there on the screen, Revelation comes from the Greek word apocalypsis. And as you can imagine from the way it sounds, it has to do with an apocalypse. Uh, it means to show or expose to view. Basically what the the term revelation means is this unveiling and that's what Jesus was doing for John he was unveiling this prophecy these visions that John was experiencing uh, on this day and so it's like it says there in the notes it's like the unveiling of a painting we've all seen where there's been this unveiling of a statue and they pull down the curtain and they unveil They review, they show or expose to view a painting or a statue. And that's the same thing that John was receiving from Jesus. Jesus was revealing, he was making this revelation, this unveiling to John of what would happen in the future. And we find, as it says there, that Jesus, uh, the reason for this was to show his servants what must soon take place. Jesus was sharing this with John so that he could share it with the church. And by doing that, it was going to share with the church things that was going to happen in the very near future, in the immediate future, and even distant future. Uh, Sort of like we talked about this morning with uh, the message and how Jesus uh, made certain prophecies. But we see that the emphasis of this book is on future events. Everything from chapter 4 through chapter 22 will be future events. Everything leading up to it is sort of a mixture of past, present, and future, so to speak. And we'll, we'll talk about all of that. But the thing that we need to know next is who wrote the book of Revelation and when did they write it? And so what we look at next is the scribe and the date of Revelation. Now, for those of you who don't have the book, who don't have the, uh, the commentary that we're using, uh, basically these headings are headings in the book. 
And I'm trying to hit some of this stuff quickly so that we can actually get to the heart of the, the biblical text rather than working our way so much through the commentary. But nevertheless, we're looking at the scribe and the date of revelation, meaning we're looking at the one who wrote it and when they wrote it. Uh, for all intents and purposes, we know that John is the one who wrote the book of uh, Revelation. And we see that the, uh, the evidence from outside of the Bible points to the fact that John would have written this during the year, around the year 95 AD. And so he would have been writing this at the end of the first century. And uh, it's believed that he wrote it then while he was uh, a prisoner on the island of Patmos during the reign of Domitian, one of the Roman emperors. Uh, John had been preaching the gospel. He'd been, had a faithful witness about Christ. And for some reason, we're not told why, we don't know why, he ended up on this uh, penal colony. He ended up on a, a, an island prison all because of his witness for Christ. And he was on the island of, Isle of Patmos. And uh, it's right near the, uh, the city of Miletus is the name of the closest city on the mainland. But it was believed that he wrote it about 95 AD. Now, one of the things that helps to point to the fact that this is most likely when the book was written, there's something, there's a mention in the reference in the, uh, that he makes in the uh, book of Revelation to the, the church at Laodicea. The thing about Laodicea that helps us pinpoint that when John wrote it is the fact that he talks about how wealthy the church was and how, uh, how good things were in the church. But some people say John was writing this around 62 AD, you know, 30 some years before he actually did write it. But the problem is in 64 or in 62 AD, there was a earthquake that destroyed the city of Laodicea. And so within about two or three years, when people were saying John would have written this, uh, after that earthquake, the city couldn't have rebuilt to the grandeur that it was experiencing at the time John wrote it. So that's just sort of a thing that, that we're able to put together from world history and from the biblical context that helps us understand that John, most, John wrote this at the end of the first century. He wrote it about 95 AD. And one other thing that we do know is that a lot of the early church fathers gave credit to John as the author and that he was writing it at the end of the first century. But as we read, when we read the text a few moments ago, we read about the spiritual blessing that comes along with reading the book of Revelation. We see that there is a blessing offered to those who read it and also to those who hear it and keep the words of the book of Revelation. And the word blessing, as we read it in the scriptures there, is similar in meaning to the word happy. That's, uh, that's the context that we ought to take it, is that, that there is a blessing. We will, be, we will find ourselves happy. We will find the blessings of God if we are not only reading God's word, but hearing God's word and following God's word. And so uh, there will be a blessing from God in regards to that. And, you know, as it says there in your notes, the book of Revelation is a source of happiness to anyone who will read it, hear it, uh, in the depths of their heart, and then obey its instructions. That's the thing is, it doesn't do us any good to read the Word of God and hear the Word of God if we don't follow the Word of God. And so, regardless if it's the book of Revelation or some other text, we need to follow it so that we can receive the blessings that God has for us. And there are a lot of blessings that we find when we follow God and follow His Word. Now, the source of revelation, the source of what we know to be the revelation that John wrote is a simple uh, following uh, the source from one line to the next. Uh, in, your, in your book, you have four, no, five spaces there that the process went through for us to see the source to those who received the revelation, the source of the revelation to those who received it. And uh, it's important for us to remain focused on where the source of revelation or the revelation came from. We see that it started with God. The revelation that 
that John received that he wrote down that we're studying that has been shared with the church for 2,000 years, it all started with God. And as we read in, the, in those first few verses, God gave the revelation to Christ. Christ gave the revelation to an angel as we'll see through the, through the text that we study. And then that angel gave it, to Christ, uh, gave it to John and John wrote it down and distributed it to the church. And when I say the church, I mean the church at large, not just the church in Ephesus or Laodicea or Pergamum or Thyatira or Sardis and all those. I mean the church. That's why we have it to study today is because John wrote it down and shared it with the church. And so the source of revelation is not John. John just happened to be the scribe. He just happened to be the one that wrote it down. But the true source of the revelation, the true source of of the timelines that we're looking at, the true source of the prophecies that we're looking at is God and God alone. He's the one that had it and he gave it to us. Now, when we read the scripture a few minutes ago, there was a phrase that I, that I read through a couple of times there. And it was that phrase of who is and who was and who is to come. That's, a, that's something that we sing in the Revelation song that we uh, are singing on Sundays occasionally. Uh, but it's a reference to the Trinity. It's a reference to God in His three persons. But it's also referring to His eternity. Uh, his eternal nature, I guess is a better way of putting that. Because He who is, meaning He's present, who was, meaning He's in the past, and who is to come, meaning that He will always be. And it's basically reminding us of the eternal nature of God, that there has never been a time when God did not exist. God existed before time uh, was created, and God will exist into eternity future when time is no longer a factor. But that is a reference to God and the Trinity and the eternal nature of God. But when we start reading in this uh, text, in uh, the first part of uh, Revelation chapter 1, John gives us a greeting. He gives us a salutation as he starts off. And he tells us basically grace and peace. Now, grace is the Greek greeting and peace is a Hebrew greeting. But the catch is, as the author puts it in the commentary, both of those come from God. Grace comes from God and peace comes from God. But both of those, one is a, it's interesting because one is a Gentile greeting and the other is a Jewish greeting. And so those greetings in the way John wrote was showing that he was writing it to the church at large, not just to the Jewish Christians, not just to the Gentile Christians. He was writing it to the whole church. And literally John was writing this to everyone who would come after him, not just the church, but people outside of the church as a warning of times to come and what would happen. See, we, we read that and we see that also, uh, not only does he reference give grace and peace from God, but he also in that same verse talks about the seven spirits uh, that are before the throne. Uh, and what he references there is, the, as you see in the notes there, the sevenfold work of the Holy Spirit. There are not seven different Holy Spirits in front of the throne of God. If you look at Isaiah 11 too, as it talks about there, it tells you about the ministries of the Holy Spirit, about the work of the Holy Spirit. And that's what, and we're not going to go to Isaiah 11 too, we just don't have the time tonight. But that's what he's talking about when he talks about the seven, uh, the seven spirits before the throne. That's what he's talking about, is the Holy Spirit and the seven ministries of the, throne, of the, uh, of the Holy Spirit. So, as we've looked at some of these things, the, maybe the most important aspect of these first eight verses that we've looked at is the Savior of Revelation. And we know that this is Jesus. And right here in the middle of his introduction, uh, he gives us some really good descriptions of Jesus. He gives us some uh, really good views into the person of Jesus, into the nature of of Christ, and so as he's talking here, he says uh, that you know this greeting is from uh, God, but it's also from the Holy Spirit and from Jesus. And as he says there first, the faithful witness, and so he references this characteristic trait of Christ that he is the faithful witness, uh, that he is the one that uh, 
that all we need to know about God is revealed through Him. That everything we could ever need to know about the characteristics of God, about His faithfulness, is revealed to us through the life and the ministry and the death of Christ. All that He did uh, shows us His faithfulness. But then it also says there that He is the firstborn from the dead. And what this means is it's referring to the fact that Christ is the first one that uh, died and then was resurrected to a glorified body. Okay, And so that's the, that's the key. Lazarus was raised from the dead. As we talked about this morning, the widow's son that Elijah raised from the dead. There were plenty of people in the Bible that were raised to life after they had died. But all of those had a mortal body that would eventually deteriorate and die. The only difference is that when Jesus was resurrected from the tomb, yes, he had a glorified body that was different than all those others. And that's what makes him special because that guarantees us that ultimately we will experience that same kind of resurrection. He is the first fruits of the resurrection. And so he was the first one to be raised with a glorified body. But then we also see that another description that, that John has of Jesus is that he is the ruler over the kings of the earth. And so right there we see that he is in control. He is sovereign. God is in control of everything. Christ has control over everything. You know, even this storm that has passed by and is now just raining on us, Jesus was in control of that. We had no, we had no concern over who was in control of that storm or anything else in our life because God is sovereign. He is in control. But then the, the author of this commentary that we're looking at, he takes a, a, a different uh, approach here. He starts to look at the work of Christ for just a moment. And that's something that cannot be uh, overlooked as we study the work of Revelation. Because what he talks about first is the present work of Christ, meaning what is he doing presently and then what is he doing in the future. And so presently we see that he says that he talks about he who loved us or loves us. Uh, and what he's talking about there is talking about the everlasting or eternal love that God has for us. That he is presently showing that love to us. And then he goes on to say that, uh, how we were freed from our sins by his blood. And we see that, that all those who receive Christ, as we talked about this morning, uh, by faith have been washed, have been cleansed of their sins, all because of the blood that Jesus shed for us on the cross. And that's part of the present work that he's doing. He is continually cleaning new Christians in the blood that he shed on the cross. But then it also says there that, uh, and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father. And like it says there in the notes, once we become a Christian by faith, once we put our faith in Christ, in the work that Christ has done for us on the cross, once that happens, Christ makes us both a king and a priest. And, and that is in the kingdom of God. And there is a day when we will rule and reign with him. And we're going to learn about that day through our study in the book of Revelation. Towards the end of the book, we're going to read about that time when we will be ruling and reigning with Christ in eternity. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that our present condition, as your notes will say, our present condition does not accurately convey our future realization. And basically what that means is who we are as believers now is, is not accurately conveyed, conveying who we will be in the future uh, as far as in eternity. And, uh, but as certain, uh, you know, it is as certain as God is eternal that we will be in heaven, that we will receive the benefits of, of Christ's death on the cross and one of the things that uh, he goes on to talk about, though, is the future work of Christ, and that is the return of Christ. Now, we've talked about the rapture, how at the beginning of chapter 4, we're going to look at the rapture, the, the, the taking away or the taking up of the church from this earth to heaven. But when we talk about the return of Christ, we generally talk about the glorious appearing. That is when Jesus comes back to bring judgment on mankind. And that's when he sets up his millennial kingdom. And so we'll look at the future work of Christ through a lot of the book of Revelation. 
But we know what he's doing right now in the lives of believers and in the lives of unbelievers who are coming to faith. Christ is still doing presently in the lives of Christians the same thing he's done for 2,000 years. So let's go on and look at verses 9 through 20. I'm going to read these to you, and we're going to look at uh, a little bit more of this introductory uh, part of the book of Revelation. So I'm going to read verses 9 through 20 for us, okay? It says, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, and what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven golden or the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as, I, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Now, does that seem like what you generally think about when you look at the book of Revelation. A whole bunch of symbolism, a whole bunch of things that don't a lot of times make a whole lot of sense. I mean, you're talking about finished brass and flames out of the eyes and all these other things that we're talking about. That's generally what we think about when we look at the book of Revelation. We think that's just a bunch of signs and symbols and I can't understand it. Well, you're going to understand all of that as we finish this. You'll understand what we're talking about tonight or next week when we're able to finish this. Uh, but as we work through this, I want you to, uh, we're going to work through from 9 to 20 in these verses to understand what's going on. But basically what happened is, as we've already mentioned, John is on the island of Patmos because of his witness and his testimony for Christ. And what happens is, because of his testimony, he ends up, go back, Stacy. um, is it? Yeah, go there. Uh, because he was uh, on the island of Patmos because of his testimony, what ends up happening is he ends up uh, this one particular day experiencing this vision. But what we see is that he was going through uh, a lot of suffering like all of the other apostles had done, except for the rest of the apostles at this point, including Peter and Paul. All of the apostles were dead. They had been martyred for their faith, and John was the last man standing. He was the last of the apostles, lived to a ripe old age, and uh, he, was, he lived to be about 90 to 100 years old. And so even, think about that, even at the age of 90, John has still got enough fire in his bones. Remember, he was one of the sons of thunder. He still had enough thunder in his bones that he got arrested and sent to prison at the age of 90 for preaching the gospel. That's basically what happened to him. That, that prison just happened to be an island in the middle of the Aegean Sea. But nevertheless, think about that. That ought to be a, a great uh, testimony and witness to all of us. But he is imprisoned by the, uh, by the emperor on the island of Patmos. And so, as the scripture says there, he's in the spirit on the Lord's day. And as you see there in the notes, it's talking about, uh, about how we as Christians go to the 
to church on the Lord's Day, as he referred to it, uh, because of the testimony that we believe Christ was raised from the dead on the first day of the week, which is Sunday. And because of that, we worship on Sundays. That's why we worship today, is because that was the day that Jesus was raised from the dead. That's the day that the church was started, basically. So that's the day that we commemorate and testify to that through that. But John is said to have been in the, uh, been in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Now that could mean one of two things. That could mean A, he's talking about being in the Spirit on a Sunday, the Lord's day, as we understand it. Or it could be that the way that he wrote it, he meant that he was in the Spirit in the day of the Lord. And if you remember from our study in the Minor Prophets, the day of the Lord was this day in the future when God brought judgment, meaning the end times. And so more than likely what is happening is John isn't in the Spirit on a Sunday. More than likely what John is talking about here is that he in the Spirit had this vision, this revelation that God gave him of the day of the Lord the Lord's day when God returns or Christ returns and brings judgment on all of mankind. That's more than likely what uh, I think that he was talking about there when he talks about being in the Lord's day is that he's talking about, I got this vision of the day of the Lord when he brought judgment on all of mankind. And that's what I, I, I think that he meant there. But he starts talking about the seven churches. And so he talks about these seven churches in Asia when he says Asia, he means Asia Minor, which we know to be the modern day country of Turkey. And um, these churches were churches that he knew of. But when we look at this, uh, Bible scholars look at these seven churches and agree that these seven churches basically fall into these four categories that we're going to look at. When you look at those, when you read about the church of Ephesus, when you read about the church at Thyatira or Sardis or Smyrna, any of those churches, uh, people, Bible scholars view those church letters to the churches in one of four ways. Okay, and that's what we're looking at. The first one is that they were just seven churches in John's day that he was familiar with and that he needed to send a letter to because Jesus said send a letter to those churches. That makes sense. And that did happen because obviously John wrote it down and sent it to those churches. So I agree, I'll, I'll tell you as your pastor, I agree with number one that as one of the answers to what those seven churches had to do with. One was they were seven churches in John's day. They were all sort of in an area there in western Turkey. But nevertheless, I believe that's part of it. The second one is that it was seven basic divisions of church history. I, I believe that too. When we look at chapters 2 and 3 and we see the letter to Ephesus, we see the letter to Sardis, we see the letter to Thyatira and on down the line, as we see those, uh, those letters, each of those letters signify a, a time period in the history of the church. Okay, we're going to go into all of this starting next week. But to give you a little bit of understanding, when you read in uh, Revelation chapter 1 here, the very first church that is referenced by Jesus to John is the book of Ephesus, or the church of Ephesus. That's the church that Paul wrote to in Ephesians, but it's the church in Ephesus. Well, the way that you view this from this second uh, viewpoint is that the church of Ephesus was from the day Christ was raised from the dead to the end of the first century. That that church of Ephesus was a time period from basically 30 AD to 100 AD. Then the next church would be from 100 AD to some other point in history. And we're going to go through all of that. But when you read through the commentary and as we work our way through chapters 2 and 3 in the book of Revelation, you'll start to see, it starts to unfold for you when you read how the timing of those periods in church history line up with the things Jesus told those churches and how those same things happen in the time periods that that we line up with church history. One is the great persecutions of the early Christians. 
Well, one of the things Jesus talks about to one of the churches is how they have endured their suffering, how they've endured their tribulations and things like that. And that's one of the things that we will see as we study through uh, those divisions. But we'll get there next week. So numbers one and two, I agree with, okay? Number three is that it's the seven types of churches that exist today. And when you read that, you can find churches that have lost their first love. You can find churches that are enduring great persecution like the house churches in Asia and like China and in other uh, Muslim countries. We can find churches today that line up with each of the, the messages sent from Jesus to those churches in, uh, in John's day. Uh, and as you see, their, their influence still cover, uh, uh, carries over from stage to stage. Just because of what happened in the time of the apostles in the Ephesian church mean, doesn't mean that everything in it ended, but can carry over from one time period to the next. And we'll, we'll talk about some more of that. I know it sounds a little confusing right now, but next week, as we start into chapter two, it'll all make a lot more sense. But the final thing is uh, how the seven characteristics uh, that can, be, can exist in any church or Christian. And that's what those are talking about. Do you know Christians who have lost their love for Christ? Yeah. We all, we all know people that have lost their love for Christ, just like the church that Jesus referenced. Do we know Christians that are struggling right now under severe persecution in countries where Christianity is not allowed? Yeah. So we can understand that there are churches and there are individuals that are needing the message that Christ is sending through John to the seven churches in his day. And so we need to make sure that we, uh, that we see those and understand those for the way that they are. But see, as John is talking, as, John, as Jesus is talking to John, he shares with him, he talks about these seven lampstands. And this is from verses 12 to 20 that we just read. Uh, and we can be very serious about what Jesus was talking about because Jesus answers for us what those lampstands were. Okay. As, as confusing as that could be, we understand that what the lampstands re, uh, signified because Jesus tells us. And so that is that the seven lampstands were the seven churches. So Stacy, go ahead and throw that next one up there. Those seven lampstands that John is seeing are the seven churches in Asia Minor. Thyatira, Sardis, Smyrna, Philadelphia, Laodicea, Pergamum. Uh, Ephesus, all of those churches, those lampstands. And so what we visualize, and I hate to do this with a music stand, but we imagine from what John says he saw, Jesus standing in the midst of seven lampstands. Okay, and it's just a, lamp, a stand with a lamp on it. And in each of those represent one of those seven churches in Asia Minor. But then he also goes on to tell us about, uh, more about the... Uh, the lampstands and the stars and the things that he saw. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to, we're going to go real quick and we're going to finish this so that we can get into chapter two next week, okay? We see that there is this vision of Christ and the churches, those seven lampstands, okay? And so what we see are the 10 characteristics of Christ when John saw him. So standing in the midst of those lampstands, John is watching Jesus standing there in the lampstands in the midst of those churches. And John lists what he sees of Jesus. He says he's like a son of man, which we talked about being a title that Jesus took on. Uh, it was a title that was used for him. It says that he was dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet. That signifies like the high priest and how they had long robes. And in the book of Hebrews, Jesus is told to be our high priest. And so Jesus was wearing a, a long robe like the high priest. Then he had this golden sash across his chest. Okay, and that signified authority on his part. Strength and authority were signified by that. But then it says that his head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow. What that signifies is the antiquity or eternal nature of God. Basically meaning that God has always existed, like we talked about earlier. And why also, as you'll learn through the book of Revelation, signifies righteousness. Because you're a Christian, you've been made righteous before God. 
And so that whiteness will be represented by the white robes worn by believers in heaven. We'll, we'll see that later too. But the fifth one was that his eyes were like blazing fire. I love the way that it puts it in the commentary. This literally means that his eyes shot fire. That's how upset Jesus was with the apathy and indifference of the churches that he was writing, having John write to. He was so, you know, it was like the old uh, Looney Tunes cartoons where, you know, you'd see uh, people get so mad that their eyes would turn red and all this sort of stuff. But John is looking at Jesus and his eyes are literally shooting fire. He is so upset about the indifference of the churches. But then he also talks about how his feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace. And bronze generally refers to judgment. Uh, the, and that's, that's one of those things that we see. The bronze altar in the tabernacle uh, where sin was judged. The bronze altar in the temple of Solomon. We saw all of those things. Uh, and they refer to judgment. It says that his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. This is not turning on the spigot or even the rain that we've been hearing tonight. This, this ain't even close. It's like a drowning out noise. If you've ever been to uh, Niagara Falls and you can't hear the person standing beside you because the roar of the waves or the roar of the water, that's the idea of what is going on here. That Jesus' voice was so powerful and so loud that you couldn't, the only voice that would be heard in judgment is going to be Jesus's. None of the, oh, but Jesus, let me explain why I didn't get saved. Or let me explain why I did this. Or why I didn't worship you. Or why I didn't study your word. We, none of that will be heard because of the roaring sound of Jesus' voice. Number eight was that in his right hand, uh, he held seven stars. This is my favorite part in the book of Revelation. And you'll understand why. Because those seven stars represent the seven angels, as we read about, uh, that were uh, the angels of the seven churches. Okay? But here is the thing. Angels or messengers here can be interpreted as the pastors of the church. The seven churches had pastors that were referred to as angels, and I think that your church has a, a pastor that would be referred to as an angel as well. Now you know why it's my favorite part in the book of Revelation. <laughs> Uh, the, uh, in all seriousness, uh, the, the term for pastor and angel uh, is, is translated messenger. And so uh, it's the same idea there. Uh, the author of the book believes that it is actually like guardian angels of that particular, uh, those particular churches. Personally, and I don't have much more, I don't have much more study than what I've read in this commentary. I think that he's referring to the pastors the ones that are ministers in the church. because he, Those letters were written to the angels, the messengers in those churches. And that's our responsibility as pastors to bring the messages from God. And so I, you know, that's one point where I disagree with, uh, you know, have a slightly different view than the, the author, but uh, nevertheless, it is what it is. Uh, number nine is that out of his mouth came a sharp, double-edged sword. And basically what that is, is the word of God. There is no defense for it in judgment. You cannot say anything against the word of God in the day of judgment and hope that you have any good excuse because we won't. Nobody will. Those that are unbelievers or those that are Christians, uh, we won't. And then it said that his face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. Uh, and this, is, this sort of talks about the divinity of Christ and how divine he was. It reminds us of the Mount of Transfiguration and how Peter and John and uh, Peter and James and John uh, just got a glimpse of Jesus in his divine glory. Uh, basically what happens when John sees this vision of Jesus standing in the lampstand is he, he passes out. I and mean, he's not cold because of the vision of Christ in all of his glory. How is that for a view? I mean, think about that. Because John is sitting here, he knows who Jesus is. He, he spent time with him. And then all of a sudden he sees Jesus in his total glory. And he just drops like he's been knocked out. So Jesus tells John not to be fearful. And this is where we're ending for tonight is the four reasons that we should not be fearful as Christians are the same four reasons that Jesus told John not to be fearful. The first one is, Jesus says, I am the first and the last. He says, I'm the first and the last. And that talks about his eternity. No matter how bad things get, Jesus is going to be in control. 
He's here. He's going to be in control no matter what. The next one is he says, I am the living one. I was dead. And so we see right here, we, it talks about Christ's sacrificial death and his resurrection and proof that we serve a risen and living Savior. You know, you can go and point to the different places where great, so to speak, religious people have died all over the world. And you can point to their tombs, but you can't point to the tomb of Christ and say there is Jesus because Jesus is risen Lord. And that's the difference between our faith and others. But then the third thing is he says, I am alive forever and ever. Meaning that Christ will not die again. That he will not change and he will always be. And the final thing is that he says, I hold the keys of death and Hades. And what these are, keys are a symbol of release. Meaning that believers shouldn't fear uh, either death or Hades because Jesus has the keys. The author uses the example of going into a prison and not being fearful because he was with the guy with the keys. But the prisoners, especially when they're new to prison, are scared of prison because they're locked up, they're incarcerated. But we are no longer prisoners. We are with the one who has the keys. And Jesus says that he has the key, holds the keys of death and Hades. He, he holds the keys of hell and death and we should have nothing to fear because our faith has been put in Christ.